first event. <laughs> so our next invited speaker is uh, Sebastian Novosin. Yeah. He comes from uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge. And uh, he's uh, going to tell us that approximate inference is biased. <laughs> Thank you. But you knew that, right? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, two things. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for putting together such a great event. Uh, the quality of the program speaks for itself. And I've uh, had a wonderful time talking about the process session. Uh, so second thing is uh, my affiliation. Yes, still Microsoft Research Cambridge, but very soon it will be Google AI in Berlin. All right. So today I'm talking about a pattern that I see, uh, a pattern that I see with approximate inference methods. And um, to illustrate that pattern, let me just give you a cartoon picture of how to think about approximate inference. So approximate means that we want to approximate something. And that something is a quantity, say that our North Star. Right? So this could be the log evidence of our model. Uh, that could be a marginal distribution. That could be a decision that we want to make under the uncertainty included in our model. Whatever it is, there's no uncertainty in it. So we have our model, we have our data, there's no uncertainty in this quantity. So the, uh, it's all fixed, it's just difficult to compute, right? And because it's difficult to compute, we use a couple of different methods. So for example, I could use a neural network with some evidence lower bound maximization, and I get somewhere in the space here, maybe with a deterministic method, I get somewhere in the space, maybe it's closed or not, I don't know, but this is my, uh, the result of my method. So then I can extend my method, I can use maybe some more elaborate family of models, a better variation distribution, maybe I get a bit closer. Or I could use, you know, normalizing flow, stochastic variation inference, so now I have a non-deterministic procedure, maybe I get even closer to this. But now the result is no longer deterministic. So that's, for example, variational inference. Or I could use Monte Carlo, which is intrinsically stochastic, and maybe I end up here. And I can run this Markov chain maybe a bit longer, so for every finite time, it's biased. But I could run, by known asymptotics, I could run this a bit longer, or I could run SMC with more particles, and I hopefully get closer and closer to this. But the problem is here that whatever I do, I don't know how far away I am. And the other problem is all of these methods for any finite computation budget turn out to be biased. So I, don't, I get a systematic deviation in the estimation plus the variance. So what's the pattern? The pattern is that we have approximate inference methods, many approximate inference methods, which are consistent. Which means that if I have some quantity, k, for example, number of particles, for example, number of MCMC iterations, for example, the number of uh, samples that I take in an IV bound, when I take this parameter k to infinity, I have some asymptotic proof that I come out with the right thing. And the only thing that constrains me is my computational limitations on this parameter k. Right? That's kind of <coughs> So now, um, to, to, uh, to illustrate you where this pattern appears, I'll give you five examples. And then afterwards, we are going to do deri derivations together, but these will be very simple derivations, so don't be scared. And all my equations have colors, so you can identify the parts, and each color, <laughs> each color has an intuition behind it, so that's uh, hopefully helpful. Um, all right, so here's five examples. So the first example is self-normalized and poly sample. So self-normalized important sampling, we want to compute some expectation of a function under some distribution P. And the problem is that P is only available to us in an unnormalized form, T tilde. So what we do is we take a distribution that we can tractably manage, say Q, that is normalized, we can compute the density, we can sample from it. We sample from Q, a number of particles, K. And then we weight them using P tilde. But the problem is P tilde is not a density that you know is normalized. So in order to normalize it, we take the empirical sum of all these weights that we have, uh, of all the density values that we have computed, the unnormalized ones. And so this is uh, asymptotically consistent. If we have a large number of particles, then this normalization doesn't really matter. But for any finite number of k, we have a bias on the order of 1 over k. And typically, in classic applications of hot sampling, it's restricted to low dimensions, and we can take tens of thousands of particles, and this bias doesn't matter. But for small k, it would not. Second example would be um, we use a near important sampling to compute the evidence. Uh, so here we have a latent variable model um, that's defined by integrating, uh, P of x is defined by integrating out of some latent variables. That, <laughs> sorry, there are no colors in this equation. Uh, and what we are really interested in is not P of x, what we are interested in is log P of x. 
So while P of X can be computed unbiasedly, just as in SMC, the log of P of X cannot be computed unbiasedly. And so euphemistically, we call that a stochastic lower bound. Sounds better than bias. But <laughs> <laughs> so we just plug in our p hat, okay, our unbiased estimate, take a lower. And again, it's asymptotically consistent. If we run AIS with a long temperature letter and many particles, we get the right result. And oh yeah, it's biased because it's the genesis of inequality. But, uh, so basically, you have a nonlinear function of the log. You take a logarithm of some unbiased estimate and the variance, and the variance translates into pulling you down because you basically integrate over part of the square. And very much similar in spirit is the i way bound. So the i way bound, we have an intractable expectation in the true quantity of interest, which is the log of the um, marginal distribution, just like in the example before. And so we do the most naive thing possible. We approximate this expectation inside a nonlinear function with a sample approximation. And normally when you have a nonlinear function and you have an expectation, and the expectation is on the inside, it's bad, right? Expectations on the outside is great, you can get unbiased estimates by Monte Carlo. Expectations on the inside, bad, right? So it's actually quite amazing that you can do this, um, and it turns out to be such a nice, uh, nice bound, you just take the empirical approximation. Again, taking k to infinity, of course, you will and get by the law of large numbers, you will get the expectation correct, and therefore, the logarithm will be correct. But for any finite k, you have this variance in the estimator, and that translates into an underestimate, a bias. Uh, okay, so I think we have seen these results already uh, today. Summar summarized, you know, taking this to 30 gets to the true log marginal likelihood. Uh, you recover the L which is all the uh, Fourth example is Markov chain Monte Carlo. So Markov chain Monte Carlo is typically the gold standard if you run it long enough, except uh, in practice, you have to run a finite number of steps, and so you truncate the Markov chain at some point, and you hope that it has reached the stationary distribution or has converged to the stationary distribution close enough um, that that it will be fine. Um, but in practice, for any finite number of steps, you will be biased. There's a very interesting work by Heiko Stratmann from UCL, um, who actually developed a debiasing procedure. You take a finite number of Markov chain steps but you get an unbiased estimator as if you were to run the MCC chain infinitely long. And that's kind of cool stuff. I will, I'll talk about this. What, when, when you say bias here, do you mean bias is, as in the expectation yeah. is biased because of the burning period? Uh, so uh, imagine you're still in the burning period, and now yeah. I would, you'd, you'd stop the chain and you take the last one samples, right? You would be biased. Right? Yeah. Or, um, because you have not, the, the initial distribution for which you started, evolves, right, so the Markov chain kernel evolves, mm -hmm. and you have this asymptotics that you, you will equilibrate towards a true stationary distribution, but you haven't yet, right, so there will be some uh, deviation. Could be that the expectation of some function, for example, the trivial zero function, which is perfect, right, depends on the function, yeah. so it's hard to quantify what the bias actually is. Um, and the fifth example, actually, also interesting, we would like to run stochastic gradient MCMC methods on large Bayesian neural networks or something, uh, but the problem is we are restricted to using small mini batches. We can't use the full full data set size, and so then we can't compute this acceptance rate uh, that we need in the major Paul Hastings correction. Um, so, for example, like the stochastic analog of MALA, which is SGLD, omits this major Paul Hastings step. Uh, but again, here, you know, we could compute this acceptance rate in our stochastic mini batch, right? So why not? Why not just why not just do this? The problem is if we do this, uh, we, we get a bias. There's both an exponenti exponentiation involved of some unbiased property and a min operation with one. Um, and there are various constructions, for example, pseudo marginal MCMC methods which deal with similar problems. And we're also going to look at this problem in a. Um, trying to. Well, can you signal me when? Oops. Can you signal uh, when I'm when I'm running out of time? I have like ten minutes left. Or something. Okay. Um, Okay, so let me, let me try again. Windows G extends. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, all right. Uh, so what we what we really want, ideally, what's our what's our north star in terms of approximate inference method? We have a we have this thing that we want to approximate. 
uh, an ideal inference method, in my mind, an approximate inference method would be unbiased. And with a bit of work, you would get a huge variance. And with a lot more work, we would just remove that variance. And so that's maybe not possible in many important cases, but that's something that we could aim for. Right? And that would be very satisfactory, because now for any inferential question, we could provide confidence intervals, or we could know we have a stopping criterion because we can estimate this variance that we have remaining, right? And so we know how far away we are from the truth. That's, that's so how are we going to get there? And I'm, I'm really uh, just kind of opening the toolbox of statistics uh, in the last eight decades and looking at what methods are there that we could leverage. And the key, um, the key way to do this is to think just of approximate inference methods as estimators, having some bias, having some variance, and looking at existing methods to trade these bias and variance off. <coughs> and so here's a taxonomy of some methods. Uh, they're probably, I don't think they are more. If you know more, let me know. Uh, there's analytic methods, resampling based methods, and stochastic methods. So analytic methods uh, include the delta method, and depending on the problem structure, case by case derivations. Uh, resampling based methods include standard resampling methods such well as jackknife resampling and bootstrap revising. And so, and so these are all basically classic methods. And then, um, and then stochastic, stochastic methods, uh, they're quite more recent methods. For example, there is a devising lemma only in the last decade or so really developed. So we are not going to cover all of them, but here are some references. Unfortunately, many of these methods turn out not to have textbook references. For example, uh, jackknife devising, you find in any standard textbook, the first order jackknife, but the higher order jackknife you only find in two JASA papers and no textbook references to this. So for every one of these, I put in the reference that I would recommend if you're interested in this. Um, for example, in bootstrap devising, there's an iterated bootstrap devising, which can also devise higher order terms, which is which I only found in Peter Hall's bootstrap lecture notes, which is also disappointing to see that you know, um, there are not more uh, comprehensive references. Anyway, so what we are going to look at is three examples, the examples picked out of the, the five I show, and how we can leverage these methods. And we start with the delta method. Uh, so what's the delta method? Um, and we, we, we illustrate that with the IV bound. So here's the IV bound again. And in the IV bound, we have this naive approximation, right? The empirical expectation approximates this, this exact expectation. So the, the delta method, in particular the delta method for moments, is just a Taylor expansion. So I'm sure every one of you here can do a Taylor expansion. So let's just do a Taylor expansion together, apply it to the IV bound, and apply the delta method. So the delta method for moments is a Taylor expansion. What we expand is a cleverly chosen point. We expand around the unknown ground truths. So here I renamed this W, it's just to wait all this logarithm of this ratio. Um, and then we evaluate this Taylor expansion at the point that we can actually evaluate. Okay, so Taylor expansion of the logarithm function, a simple univariate function. Um, at this point, expectation of W, and then evaluate it at this point. So we write this here plus this quantity minus this quantity, nothing has changed, right? So then we get the first order Taylor term expansion, and then for the logarithm, the Taylor expansion, you have to trust me on this, has this form. Okay, so now let's color the equations. Uh, we have the quantity that we actually evaluate in the IV. We have the quantity that we are really interested in. This is a true quantity, right? The one that we really want. And this are some, you can think of them as correction terms, which are all attractable. So we have not really gained. Something, except let's let's reorder these terms. So now we have a reordering. We have this true quantity is the quantity that we can evaluate plus this correction. Term. So now we have it in the right order. So now we can try to actually peel off some terms of this infinite sum. We try to peel them off and, and actually see if we can evaluate them. So far so good. So let's do that. Let's let's peel off the first term. The first term is just a linear term. So I I just increase this from one to two. <coughs> And the linear term, well, this is an expectation. This is the empirical average. This is unbiased, right? So this whole expectation will be zero. So, mm, so that wasn't, wasn't very good. So we have to get rid of that term. It's exactly zero. Let's try the next, the next term, the second term. Okay, so now I, I moved out the second term. Index goes to three here. So now we have something more interesting. This is uh, the variance of the weights. And this is the squared mean of the weights. Okay. 
So now we, we can't really compute that, right? Because we don't know this quantity. But what we can do is we can just put in estimated moments of these weights, right? These, these log weights. So, so these are just basically the variance estimate of the log weights divided by twice the squared mean of the log weights. Surely we can put that in, right? So that's our, and then the rest, rest of the terms we drop. <laughs> <laughs> right? So actually, this is a method that EYT has proposed 2007, eight years before Yuri Boda proposed the I rebound, and this is known as delta method behind. And actually, yes, it knocks down the bias to from one over k to one over k squared. So there's a technical result here in, in, in the IK paper uh, that yes, indeed, the bias of this estimator is one over k squared. Okay. And this, I mean, may not be the case. I mean, may not be the case a priori before proving it, because taking ratios of estimated quantities may have some bias as well. But actually, it does produce a bias, and these are some, you know, moment quantities of the underlying weight distribution. So I can't compute this, but I know that the order is one of the case. Okay, so this can be as simple as that. Make sense? So let's move on. Let's move on to the jackknife devising. Um, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay. Good. Right, so forget everything about the jackknife. If you remember this picture, you, you can really write everything. Okay, so this picture is, is key. Let's think about general estimators. Uh, I replaced K with N for this, for this picture. But let's think of an estimator that you evaluate at N samples and you evaluate some quantity. For example, the IV. Now, uh, I plot this not at N, but at 1 over N, the inverse sample size. So what I really want, I want my estimator, I want to evaluate it at 1 over infinity. Right? Then it's consistent, there's no variance, I get the perfect truth, the green point here. But I cannot. So what I do instead is I evaluate it at one less samples. So instead of eight samples, say I evaluate it at seven samples. I get another point, and then I perform linear regression and take the intercept with the y-axis and say, okay, this is my estimate. Such a simple idea. Um, so does it work? And the answer is, in general, for any smooth function of moments, it does work, and it cancels out the first order bias. Um, and you can extend this to quadratic and cubic and so on, polynomial interpolations, and it cancels out the higher order terms as well. Um, there's a deep link between this. Actually, it's the same. It's a stochastic version. The Jack is a stochastic version of a technique called the Shanks transform for series acceleration. So if you have a series, a deterministic series that is sum to infinity, there are many acceleration methods how you, how you can basically accelerate convergence that in, internally perform interpolation. This is a stochastic analog of this. Okay, so let's apply it. Um, actually, I may have to skip some of these slides. So it's easy to see how it would cancel the bias. So the, the basic, yeah, let's do this slide. The basic intuition is that if you take the expect, expectation of some estimator, there's often an expansion, asymptotic expansion, of being the truth plus <coughs> 1 over k plus 1 over k squared. That's what like, for example, we have seen with the delta method. Right? That's exactly this form that we have. So now, if you take a weighted combination, this is a closed form solution of this linear interpolation evaluated at zero. This is a closed form solution because of linear regression is very easy. If you take this expectation of this quantity, so weighting was k minus k minus 1 times k, and you just evaluate this quantity. You see that the k minus 1 cancels out with this k minus 1 here, the k cancels out with this k here. And so basically, you have a1 minus a1, and therefore you cancel the first order bias. Right? So this is how it technically would work. Um, okay, and then the generalization, so the original jack was from 1949, and then the generalization is, uh, eliminates the only bias to any order. Um, you trade it off for a bit more variance, but the variance is not as bad as you would think. Um, and then, for example, here is the second order uh, jackknife where you take a weighted combination of three estimators evaluated at n samples, n minus one samples, and n minus two samples. Okay, so I applied it to jackknife. I think I can skip this uh, due to variational inference. I think I can skip this. This is basically the same application of this jackknife method to to the IV bound. And you can see for this example, this is the bias that remains for IV. The bias for delta method variational inference is already the order is minus two, it's a log up dot. And then uh, JBI1, JBI2, JBI3 knock down the bias to different polynomial orders, just as advertised. So, and this translates, of course, into sample savings. So, you basically, uh, the elbow has, in this case, eight nuts bias, and then here you would have 
if you reduce the bias to 0 0.08 or something, you would have to have 80 samples in IV. So it translates into savings. Uh, evaluated on VIE VI models as well, it translates. Interestingly, if you train with this JVI objective, it does not work very well. So I don't know why. There is some explanation regarding the doubly reparameterized gradient estimates, but even if you fix it in their paper, they can run JVI experiments, it also doesn't work very well. It works very well for estimating the evidence for any trained model, but it doesn't work well for training. I don't understand why. So it's interesting. Uh, okay, let's look at five minutes left or something. Yeah, let's look at the uh, a case by case derivation. Let's look at the stochastic metropolis Hastings acceptance rates. Okay, that's an interesting case. If we could do this, we could have SGLD that would be unbiased. Um, so actually, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. I'm going to um, point to a paper from the physics community. It's always great if you can start a sentence with, I found something in, uh, from physicists. Uh, a 1998 paper called Penalty MCMC <laughs> by Tsipale and Deving. And they showed how to do MCMC with stochastic uh, acceptance rates. Um, and so the basic assumption here is if you do a metropolis Hastings on a mini batch, um, then you take eventually you, uh, you compute the logarithm of this ratio, right? So you have a new proposed parameter, you have an old parameter, you take the mini batch distribution, um, and that, that this logarithm of this ratio can be accurately modeled as a normal distribution. And this is a very reasonable assumption, for example, in the case of Bayesian neural networks or any kind of uh, uh, a Bayesian large data setting because you have maybe you know 100 mini batch samples out of a million possible samples, and the sum of 100 log, uh, log likelihoods, the sum of 100 likelihoods is um, the log likelihoods is a normally distributed variable by the central limit theorem. So it's very reasonable assumption, and practice is just fine. So here's the example: we have a term like this, we have the prior term that no variance there whatsoever, right? It's constant, plus a stochastic term sampled from the mini batch weighted by these compensation of a sum of many variables, so small. Make sense? Or it's a lot of notation, but... Um, okay, so then, uh, here's the idea. There is a more formal proof. Unfortunately, it's not in the paper from them. They have a very abbreviated proof. Um, it took uh, my, my co-author, Alex, gone quite some while to, to work out the proof in detail. Um, but the basic intuition is this. If this is normal, and then I exponentiate this quantity, then the resulting distribution will be log normally distributed. Right, so uh, an exponentiated normal random variable has a log normal distribution. And then we can get an unbiased estimate of this quantity by just taking the expectation of a log normal distribution. So by known quantities on the Wikipedia page of the log normal distribution, you know what the mean of that log normal distribution is. It's simply the exponentiation of, uh, exponential of this quantity plus some variance time. And so what Zipperle and David do is they just cancel this additional term by multiplying it with an exponential of the estimated variance. And then you cancel this term, and what remains is the exponential of this quantity, which is the true quantity of the full data posterior. Right? So, you, if, so this is what you're interested in. This is the, uh, you have an unbiased estimator of the slot ratio, the log ratio, but it has some variance. So by adding this penalty factor, which is always smaller than one, so you reduce the acceptance rate stochastically. If you have high variance, you have a high reduction in acceptance rate. <coughs> if you have variance of zero, you recover the original. Right? So it has just the right quantities. And then you exactly cancel uh, the bias. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, but we, I mean, do we have access to this function v usually? Or no, we need to estimate it. We need to do empirical estimates, but we can actually get these estimates. But you also bring some bias, right? So uh, correct. Correct. So, uh, yeah, good question. So we can think about improved estimators, or we can think about does this bias matter? It's a fair question. We need to estimate mu, and we need to estimate v. Okay, so what we did is we took this idea basically uh, and we extended this. There's a slight extension one has to do because they assume symmetric proposals. So we want to extend this to Langevin dynamics, to Maha, um, to Metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm. 
and therefore we have to make a small extension. Uh, and the, the goal was really to make SGLD valid for any step size by adding the stochastic rejection. Because SGLD has an asymptotic justification, stochastic gradient larger model dynamics has an asymptotic justification where if you take the step size to zero, then it's uh, the acceptance rate close to one, and therefore we can omit this step. But here we want to use it for any step size. Okay, uh, so here's a simple experiment, and then I wrap up. The simple experiment is this, a normal, 1D normal experiment. We have a normal sample from a prior, a scalar, Right, and then we have a thousand observations, batch size of 64, and we want to infer the posterior, which is known to us here by conjugacy. We can compute the analytic posterior, so we can evaluate how good we do. Right? So it's a very simple thing. I run this actually this week. Um, okay, so here's the experiment, and we plot the Kolmogorov Smirnov statistic, which is the maximum deviation anywhere on the real line between the empirical CDF we get out of the MCC machine versus the true CDF. Okay, this is a very conservative statistic. So this is zero, you got really a good procedure. It won't be exactly zero because you have an empirical CDF, but it will be close to zero. So on the x-axis, we have the step size of SGLD. And basically, compare the yellow line. SGLD works really well if you have very small step sizes and induces a bias when you have a large step size. And the CD method basically remains very close to the zero line. So here, yeah, it's fine. There are only this method is, and the others two are two baselines. So we could just pretend we do the metropolis hastings ratio on the batch, then we would get the green line. And if we would naively apply it separately, David, without our extension, you would get the pink line. So basically, um, and then of course, if you look at effective sample size, actually, it turns out to be nice that you have uh, a peak here, where the step size is actually quite a bit larger than where where the um, SGLD method was already having some bias. Right, so this actually really is useful. It may not extend to high dimensional settings because you have a high variance and therefore the penalty factor will go to zero. So this is for the 1D case. I think there are ways to make to handle that, but um, the other interesting thing is you basically get good performance at 57% acceptance rate, which is for larger one dynamics, the optimal <coughs> acceptance rate in a high dimensional case. Okay, conclusions. Uh, approximate inference is an estimation problem. There is a big toolbox available to us uh, of the last eight or nine decades of statistics that we can use to play around with approximate inference methods to trade off variance versus bias and the other way around. Um, let's use it. And here is some, some rough taxonomy. So thanks a lot. Yeah, so Ri and Ling introduced, or reintroduced, based on this Russian relay construction, the dike devising my mind into statistics. And a lot of this uh, stochastic devising work, work, especially also at UCL, or like the Stratman's work and so on, they, they come from this paper on Ri and Ling. Yeah. Um, so it's 2005 or something. Uh, yeah. I think so. So, so this devising lemma is interesting. It's basically a method. Um, to exactly debias certain summation problems um, by a finite truncation. So you do a stochastic truncation. It's essentially that it's stochastic. So with some probability mass, you observe very many summation terms. With the majority of probability mass, you observe only a few terms. And then by proper weighting, you can actually get the exact infinite sum from only finite computation. And this is quite remarkable. Um, so it's a very powerful technique. It has been applied also to Bayesian inference. Uh, there's this line paper from two years ago, uh, also from UCL, um, but it, yeah, it's, it's not the most efficient one. So actually, it's um, I think computation is, is, is an issue still, but it's a very intellectually very satisfying method. Other questions? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. So in the document that the I approach, does actually the second order correction increase the variance of your? Uh, yeah. Um, Almost always, if you get reduced bias. Yeah. <laughs> so, you say you say, like, how much so usually a trade-off. Yes. So, um, so adding a ratio of, expect, uh, of estimated moments um, surely adds adds variance. Yes, you made that. Um, yeah. And uh, another thing is so also so uh, in uh, that last bit on, on MCMC, uh, when you use an expectation, is it uh, an acceptance? 
right, that, that's uh, correct in expectation. Is, is that sufficient to give you detailed balance? Of yeah, that's sufficient. Okay. That's sufficient. Um, yeah. It's uh, basically the easy way to see it is you extend the space by this extra random choice, right? and then if the marginal is correct, so basically I sample in every iteration, I sample a new mini batch, and then I have the conditional. So it's an easy way to, to see that it's correct. Right? Um, yeah, so I was wondering whether you can speculate a little bit on why estimating stuff more correctly then doesn't help with the training. That is do we really care about estimating more correctly if it doesn't help? It's it's super interesting. There's lots of discussions uh, in the review of the ICLAIR paper, but also <coughs> generally. I mean, uh, there's two two points, right? So one thing is all the elbow and IV variants. They have a nice point of underestimating the the evidence, right? So this safeguards you in a way, right? Whereas I can construct an estimator which has reduced bias, but maybe overestimates. It has less bias overall, but it overestimates. So now you can pick, right? And I think it depends very much on the inferential question, right? So if you want to do on a benchmark, you want to do model comparison, uh, we shouldn't use an estimator which can overestimate the evidence, right? But if you really want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know ac accurately approximate an expectation or something, right? So then reducing bias is, I think, a worthwhile goal. So it depends a bit. Um, now, why doesn't it help for training? I, I first thought it would just be the variance of the gradients. That's also I mean, what reviewers saw and so on. But interestingly, in this doubly reparameterized gradient estimator paper, they find it also, it also doesn't help if they apply their, their uh, provably having lower variance gradient estimates to this part. So I honestly don't know why, why it doesn't work. For, for estimating the evidence for a trained model, I think it's great. Uh, I would use it for that. And the code is online. Uh, yeah. Good. I think we're way over time. <laughs> okay, so let's thank Sebastian again. Now there's uh, another coffee break slash uh, poster session. Uh, we are continuing the last session at 4 p.m. I don't know what you're watching.